All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Victoria Van Thunen. I am a family nurse practitioner here at the NYU Endometriosis Center. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really excited for tonight's um, webinar because we'll be talking with two patients um, that have had experience here at the Endometriosis Center. Um, the topic of tonight's uh, webinar is to, again, discuss with patients who are young adults who have kind of navigated this um, journey with endometriosis and what their experience has been um, prior to the diagnosis, what diagnosis has looked like for them and um, what interventions they ultimately had and where they're at now. Um, so if you two wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, Nadia, I'll ask you to introduce yourself first. Hi, everyone. My name is Nadia Asgari-Tari. Um, I'm 23 years old. I live in New York City, um, and I currently work in uh, foreign policy. Um, and Gabriella, I'll pass it to you. Hi, uh, I'm Gabriella. I'm 22. I am a nursing student in my last year, um, and I'm from New Jersey. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. So um, again, it is Tonight will be pretty informal. It's mostly just discussion. Um, I just figured it'd be empowering for other patients um, kind of going through a similar situation to understand what the trajectory of all of this means um, and better understand what the symptoms are, what to look out for, um, and kind of figure out what works, what doesn't work. Although this journey is very um, individual, there might be some crossover for some others. So. Um, I guess the first question we should start with is when you first noticed these symptoms, um, what really stood out for you? And if you are comfortable sharing, kind of walking us through what those symptoms looked like. Whichever one of you want to go first, sorry. Okay, uh, I guess I can start us off. Um, so I feel like, you know, I uh, have always had really, really painful periods. And so you know, I think there was always kind of the background um, since I was like 12 or 13. And as I kind of talked to doctors, I would kind of mention my pain. That word was always kind of thrown around. Um, but it wasn't until um, about a year ago that I, you know, just started getting really, really bad pain, um, kind of it mostly concentrated in like my pelvic area, um, somewhat in my like kind of lower back. Um, and I had recently just got an IUD placed about a year ago. And so I thought at first it was just kind of an issue with the IUD. Um, and that was kind of my like initial first thought. Uh, but, you know, a, a little bit of nausea, mostly pain. Uh, and that was kind of my, my first symptoms. So um, I got my period around 11 years old. Um, and I just thought it was something that was supposed to be painful. And if you had a lot of bleeding, like that was normal. Um, so I didn't think anything of it for years and years. And then about my sophomore, junior year of high school, I started developing um, rectal spasms. Um, and it was just this stabbing pain that would jolt me like out of my seat. And I ignored it and didn't think anything of it initially. And then it started to occur to me like, no one else talks about this. No one else has this. And I would shrug it off and I would pretend it was like a back spasm um, because it was it was embarrassing. Um, and then I noticed that it seemed to happen like closer or during my period. And then my period seemed to just get more painful over time. And um, around senior year of high school was when I started saying, okay, I know this can't be normal. I know people have different normals, but this just doesn't seem right. So I spoke to my OBGYN at the time and uh, I had done some research being that I was interested in the medical field. And I said, based on my symptoms, you know, I looked into this thing called endometriosis. I'm, I'm wondering if I could have this. Um, my symptoms seem to line up with it. And the provider mentioned that she wasn't um, like specialized in that, that she wouldn't do surgery on me anyway, um, even if I was her daughter, cause I asked her to kind of look at me like that. Like if I was your daughter, what would you do? And um, she said, honestly, you know I would recommend trying birth control. You know, it's non-invasive. So 
long story short, I tried that for about a year. Um, I started with loloestrin because I wanted to try low dose. I, I didn't want all the symptoms that I'd heard all my friends had gone through with birth control. And um, I just found that I was bleeding more. So then we tried a regular dose pill and then um, I was bleeding more. And then we found a three month pill, which seemed to work great until it didn't. So then I said, you know what? I'm done with the birth control. Um, I'm just going to get off of it. And then I pretty much ignored it until about last February, uh, a little bit before that, actually. And um, I'd had uh, internal ultrasounds done, all kinds of scanning, and they found free fluid in my pelvis. And they said, oh, that just looks anatomical, you know, nothing to worry about. Um, and then I found a new OBGYN and just going to different doctors. And then I was recommended to go to um, uh, an oncology GYN. And, um, she said, you know, I heard about this doctor at NYU, Dr. Wong, and, um, they have a whole multidisciplinary team. I think she's worth looking into. Um, and I said, okay, now that I had a name, I felt like I had some direction because everyone that I'd been seeing didn't really know what to do with me. And, felt like it was imp like even the oncology Joanne felt that it was improper if she dealt with the potential for endometriosis because she said I can do the laparoscopic surgery to see if you have it and I can excise it but that's not my specialty so that was when I found Dr. Huang and uh, last February you know she gave me two options after my MRI scans and basically that was to try birth control again uh, or do surgery and I said you know what let's try it again um, and I did until I want to say it was this past April. And then after still having symptoms and having increased bleeding again, I decided that it was time to do surgery. And I had my surgery um, August 10th, uh, 2022. Yeah, I was going to say you're you're kind of newly uh, in recovery, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I know that you both kind of briefly mentioned it, but how soon after you started keying into these um, symptoms would you say that you started to seek care? You're like this, something is definitely wrong here. Um, and when you did start kind of that initiation of care, who did you go to regarding these symptoms um, in your life? Was it a parent? Was it a significant other? Was it um, a, a provider that you trusted? Um, who kind of helps you get the ball rolling with figuring out what was going on here? Um, so I was, like I said, kind of under the impression that it was an issue with my IUD at that point, um, just because I had had issues with my IUD previously. Um, and so I think that was like my first thought. Um, and in, you know, a true like Gen Z fashion, I like waited a good seven to eight months um, just because, again, I feel like, one, I was like, it could be this, but I think as Gabriella mentioned, um, I kind of was under the impression that periods come with pain. Um, and it was something that was the only thing I had known for so many years. Uh, so finally, as kind of the pain continued to get worse, um, I went to, I was in Philadelphia at the time and I decided to do an ultrasound just to make sure the IUD was in the right place. Um, and I kind of get a letter in the mail, uh, because it's Philadelphia law that if something is abnormal, uh, they have to send you a letter. So I get a letter saying, you know, that, you know, the providers need to talk to me about my diagnosis. Um, I get the, I call them back. Uh, and, you know, it was basically what I had heard was IUD was fine. Um, and they suspected that I had an endometrioma and I had adenomyosis, um, but that, you know, they would need to kind of just like monitor it to, to see what that meant. Um, and, you know, after, you know, many years and especially like seven to eight months of consistent pain, obviously it takes a while to get the ultrasound scheduled and get the results back. And so at this point, you're looking closer to nine months. Um, you know, it just felt like there was a lot more wait and see. Uh, and I just wasn't really at that point kind of comfortable with wait and see because I felt like that's what I had been doing already. Um, so I went to another OBGYN who looked at me. Um, you know, and they were like, you know, we can try pelvic floor therapy. And that was the first time that I actually mentioned the word endometriosis. And they were like, oh, you definitely don't have endometriosis. And I said, okay. 
Um, and again, you know, more months of pain. Uh, one of my, you know, best friends, her sister is an OBGYN. I showed her the ultrasound um, and she said I would, you know, not bet my license on it, but I would feel very, very comfortable to tell you to get a second opinion. Um, was finally referred to another doctor, kind of took a look and uh, was the first person to kind of schedule the MRI. Um, and I feel like when I got the MRI results back and she called me and she was like, Nadia, you know, <laughs> you definitely are not crazy and you do have endometriosis. Um, and I feel like at that point, it was just a, a really important moment, I think, as women, especially as young women, as like a person of color, uh, oftentimes, you know, our pain is sometimes ignored or dismissed. Um, and so it was a really important moment, I think, to me to kind of uh, feel like I was finally being heard after so long. Um, and I think, you know, I turned to my mom, who was a nurse, um, my boyfriend, and, and, you know, really a lot of people that gave their recommendations of, of you know, people that had friends or connections in the medical field. Um, and I think that I'm very lucky for the fact that I knew people who knew people, um, or it could have even been even longer until I, you know, got a, a diagnosis. Um, you know, this is also compounded with the fact that I'm type one diabetic, which does make everything slightly more complicated. Uh, and so while having a diagnosis was nice, it just was like another thing on top of a, a lifetime of, of medical problems that I've known. So, um, that was, that was my experience. So I feel like it's kind of hard to say because I'd say that around like, uh, sophomore, junior year of high school, which was 2016, 2017, I started to really hone in on, okay, something's wrong. And then 2018, when I started the birth control the first time and then decided, you know, this isn't doing it, I'm, I'm suffering more, you know, it kind of felt counterintuitive to, you know, um, getting Dr. Huang's name from a provider that I'd only seen once, um, that I don't know if I would have found her on my own, you know, going into the city, being from New Jersey. Um, so it definitely took a few years. Um, and like Nadia said, feeling like, okay, I'm not crazy. Like you're not making up pain. Um, but my mom and my boyfriend were there for me, you know, through the whole thing. Like when I started the birth control, I was nervous. Like I'd heard of so many people having crazy symptoms and I didn't, I didn't want that, but I said, okay, this is, this is better than surgery. Right. You know, like I had to talk myself through it and it felt like a really big decision to make. Um, and I didn't know if I was making the right decision. And I had a provider tell me that based on where, um, the scans show that your endometriosis is, um, you could end up with your bowel being perforated and a temporary colostomy. So I said, oh my God, am I adding insult to injury? If I, seek, you know, care and I decide to go with something more invasive, like, am I going to wake up from surgery in a worse position than I started with and wish I was where I was initially? Um, so it took a while, but I had a really good support system um, standing, standing behind me and leading me where I needed to be to get the right care. Yeah, thank you both for sharing that. That's I think the one thing that you both touched on that's really important, um, and I find myself saying over and over again to patients that I meet um, regularly, is that pain is not normal, um, especially when it's impacting your quality of life to the degree at which endometriosis does. Um, and I think kind of you touching upon the point that oftentimes women in particular are kind of invalidated. Um, when we speak about pain, pain is not normal. Period pain is not normal. Um, especially if, if, you know, you can't get out of bed, you can't go to work. Um, you know, you're having pain with intercourse. Um, this is not normal. Um, and I appreciate you both being so candid about kind of the, I guess, more or less roadblocks you've had from other providers um, and trying to, I, I give you a lot of credit for persisting in, in um, kind of finding the right care, because again, the, the pain is, uh, that's completely not normal. And I think the MRI, unfortunately, is kind of the last step where people get to when they're like, okay, now I have something tangible. Um, see, I'm not crazy. There's a report that says I'm not crazy, which 
um, I can understand that sentiment, but I, I don't think that it should ever have to get to that point. Um, so I appreciate you both speaking to that. Um, so I know that you both kind of touched on how you ultimately came to the endometriosis center. I'm curious about what your experience has been. Um, Gabrielle, I know that you and I had met initially before everything. So if you want to talk about kind of what the first step was for you and um, kind of your trajectory through the endometriosis center and Nadia, you as well. I, I know that you and I didn't initially meet, but I know that you're a, a patient of Dr. Espar's. Um, so kind of what your um, experience was when you came through the door and, and kind of through to surgery. So it, I feel like it's kind of crazy because, you know, COVID has now created this like um, virtual like platform to meet. So initially, I think it was February 2021 was when I had my first virtual with Dr. Wong. Um, and that was where we had the birth control or surgery. And I said birth control for sure. And then um, that was February 2021. And then the following April. So I want to say it was April, March or April, 2022, um, I think was when I called back and I said, um, you know, I'm not getting better. I, I think I'm getting worse. And, um, that was when I met with Dr. Wong again, I believe virtually. And then that's what led to my in-person with you, Victoria. Um, and I, I felt, so grateful for that. That was my first, um, you know, inpatient going into the city. Um, and you gave me a sense of peace that I didn't have, um, from other providers. I, I felt a lot of fear and I'm not a scared person, but like, I know you can't give a false sense of security, but you can present the facts. And I think the facts that I was given prior to finding the endometriosis center were, so like directed in one way instead of laying everything out and you were honest with me and you you know you you gave me the benefits that I didn't hear from other providers so I felt a sense of comfort and I felt like I I knew everything I should know going into it and um you educated me about the IUD which um was never proposed as an option to me prior um, with other providers like and about having the surgery and then having the IUD placed after and that showing um, the marina specifically showing the best results. So I just felt more comfortable going into surgery. And then I had met with Dr. Wong, I think virtually to kind of have a quick discussion about this is what to expect going into it. And then I had my surgery. So um, I, I'm so glad that I met with you. Um, I, you know, being in nursing school, you know, we learn about like holistic care and seeing people as the whole person, not just the disease process. Um, so you just, you just made me feel comfortable. And I told Dr. Wong that even the care that I received that day was amazing. Um, and I, I think that's, what's helping me benefit each, each and every day, you know, since the surgery. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for saying that. Nadia, go ahead. I'm sure. So I feel like once I kind of got the, the official like green light from the MRI, things moved a little bit quicker. Um, obviously, you know, it takes time to get an appointment and kind of get all that figured out. Um, but similarly, I met with Dr. Ezwar virtually. Um, and I think, you know, I echo Gabriella's sentiments that it was a really just kind of candid conversation um, and a lot of questions that I had enough time to Google a lot about endometriosis, you know, before I had met with doctors. And so I had questions about fertility um, and things that I just did, you know, I'm 23 and not something that's definitely top of mind. Um, and so just thinking through what that meant for me, even in that sense, um, like, you know, questioning if I need to like freeze eggs or, you know, anything like that, which I just didn't even really know the process about at that point. Um, and so I, you know, had pretty in-depth questions. Um, we talked about kind of my range of options. I had been on an IUD off and on for already four years and, you know, uh, definitely was an improvement without any sort of birth control. Um, but, was still in, in pain pretty much every single day um, and just kind of worse on my period. And so we talked through um, a, a one type of medication, continuing birth control or surgery. And, you know, I just kind of was 
I think while surgery feel, felt like a little bit more of a, a, what's the word, like intense next step, um, it also just felt like I had kind of done everything else. Um, I think side effects of other medications were worrisome. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think that continuously throughout the entire process, it just felt like my questions were finally being answered. And, you know, as we talked about after just years and like so many months of kind of getting the runaround, um, it was really refreshing to see. Um, also trying to see, you know, the impacts of surgery and diabetes. These are all kind of things that kind of go in tandem. Same with like pain and diabetes, you know, uh, obviously it can cause your blood sugars to go up. And so everything was so multifaceted and I felt like the way that it was addressed was really helpful um, and just kind of hearing my concerns and, and next steps. So um, ultimately I'm you know, really glad that I decided to go the surgery route. I think it was the right move. And I ended up doing an IUD during surgery um, just because the insertion process is known to be quite painful uh, without medication. And most providers don't uh, do any sort of um, medicine with an IUD insertion. And I think that that has also been super helpful um, to be able to kind of do two birds in one stone. Great, thank you. Yeah, I guess I should mention for, for the patients that are watching who um, might be new to the endometriosis center, we generally recommend MRIs done with NYU to help diagnose um, endometriosis. And although it's not considered definitive diagnose, which uh, diagnosis for endometriosis, um, considering the gold standard, so to speak, is biopsy, which would obviously be done through surgery. Um, the MRI is about 85% accurate, picking up what we call plaques or lesions of endometriosis. So um, for anyone who's wondering about what this MRI is and why everyone's getting one, um, it's kind of a way to give us uh, our best understanding of what's going on prior to patients undergoing surgical intervention and anesthesia and, you know, incisions and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, cool. Um, I guess my next question would be related to what maintenance looks like for you both. I know that you both mentioned the IUD, um, though there are other ways that we maintain um, endometriosis postoperatively. Uh, and uh, surgery is very, is has been very successful for many patients, but I think, and you both can speak to this, there is some level of maintenance after surgery. Um, you know, this is a lifelong condition. Um, there isn't necessarily a cure at this time. Um, so I'd be curious to know what other interdisciplinary teams you've tapped into, um, or really any other interventions, holistic interventions that you have found success with or haven't um, that you could share with, with us. Um, so I will say, I think since surgery, which I had my surgery in May of this year, um, and then since the placement of the new IUD, which was, I'm forgetting the exact name, but it's kind of the like second version, which I believe is the five-year one. Um, I really haven't gotten a proper period since then. Um, and I think that was potentially one of the goals was to be able to kind of, if you can lessen or not have the period, then that can help with kind of the, uh, you know having new lesions or, or some of the pain processes. And so I feel like my pain level has gotten from like a consistent nine to eight to now like a occasional three, um, which has been, a, I mean, a huge difference in just kind of the day-to-day -day life um, and, you know, not having to cancel events or, you know, hang out with friends or anything because of kind of pain levels. Um, you know, I think the other thing that you know, I, I know that I'm fresh out of surgery. Um, I guess we both are. And so, um, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on things consistently and kind of keeping track, either like journaling through uh, what kind of made pain worse if it did come up um, that day and just kind of trying to track through things. Um, I, you know, have been told also with like, you know, there are certain like dietary uh, changes in terms of things that foods that kind of are more inflammatory versus not and kind of keeping track of that as well. Um, and so I think that's been a little bit of my management is at this point, just like additional kind of research um, on what my body responds well to and what it doesn't um, and kind of going from there. Um, so it's kind of hard to talk about how my period has normalized because um, since I just had the surgery in August, um, 
you know, I'm still, I think my body's still processing the IUD and stress from starting um, a semester of school. Um, but I don't have that um, debilitating pain where I feel like, how am I going to go to school? Like, how am I going to get up and go to the hospital? or um, fear of having, you know, a spasm in front of someone, which has lessened um, significantly. Um, as far as pain management, um, Advil occasionally, um, but I don't need it often, um, and heating pads. Um, and those that was a lifesaver after surgery, just to relax the area. Um, and then as far as like additional methods. Um, I've gone for craniosacral therapy, um, which I highly recommend. Um, very relaxing. Um, it's kind of like having a massage, but less hands-on. It's it's light touch. Um, and it's just very relaxing. It's just a form of self-care um, that I've had done. I'd like to try acupuncture. I've heard really good things, but I can't speak on it because I haven't done it yet. Um, but that's that's pretty much what I've done so far. Oh, and going for, going for walks for sure. That was something I did, um, not right out of surgery, but pretty soon after it just kind of felt like I was doing something to help myself, but not pushing myself too much. Yeah. We, we generally tell patients, everyone is, uh, always wondering what the recovery is like after, you know, minimally invasive, uh, excision surgery. And, I mean, you, you both can speak to this, but generally we, we recommend patients get up and moving as soon as possible within, you know, within reason. Um, but walks are, are generally pretty good. How was your recovery after surgery? Um, you know, I, I know I generally tell patients to plan for about two weeks off, just kind of taking it easy. Um, Gabrielle, I know that we talked a little bit about your recovery. Um, if you want, share a little bit um, about that. Sure. Um, so I, um, my semester was set to start August 22nd. So basically at the beginning of August, I went on a vacation and that was when the ball started to get rolling. Cause I think right before vacation, I think it was July 28th. I had the appointment with Dr. Wong to say, okay, I think I want to do this. And I said, my issue is I start school August 22nd. And my clinical start that week and I can't miss a day in the hospital. So the ball kind of went rolling quick and it was, I had a vacation and this is when I get back. And then I had to have blood work done and a COVID test and everything just fell into place. And I kind of feel like that was divine intervention in a way, like it was meant to happen um, because everything just worked out on such a tight schedule. Um, but you know, I woke up from surgery and I was in pain, which was expected. Um, and then my drive home, um, my, my mom drove me, it was about 45 minutes, 50 minutes uh, back to New Jersey. And then, like you said, it was about 10 days, like 10 days to two weeks. So I had it timed out that my surgery was August 10th and then I was in school August 22nd. Um, and I was, and I was able to do it with minimal pain. And honestly, the pain at that point, I'd say about two weeks later was mostly incisional. Like it was just directed at where the probes were placed. Um, most of the pain immediately after surgery was directed at the location of the IUD and then internally what was done. Um, but the, I would say the two weeks is totally accurate. Um, yeah, so my mom uh, came for my surgery and she's a nurse. Uh, and so definitely she was very strict with my walking regimen, I will say. Um, and so, you know, I think the first, I would say three days were the hardest. Um, I, you know, am very type A and I like having information. And so I kind of got a lot of information from like friends of friends who, you know, uh, kind of found out I was having the surgery. Um, and they were very helpful in just making me aware. I think I had a, a range of different kind of answers of what people's surgery experience was like. Um, and so I think I kind of went in there with like the, this is like worst case scenario versus best case scenario. And I think having that, all of that information was really helpful, um, just for my personality. Um, 
And so, yeah, I think it was about three days of, of pain. I will say the hardest part is that I have very sensitive skin and it seemed like my, I developed like a reaction to like the tape, um, which that was very hard because it was just like, I had some sort of allergic reaction to the tape on it. Uh, so it was less even about the pain and more of just kind of the allergy that I didn't know I had. Um, so kind of making sure I was combating that properly. Um, and I agree. I mean, I wasn't able to take a full two weeks off of work, but, um, you know, they were really flexible with me. I feel like for the most part, it was just kind of like my body was exhausted. Um, and so after those initial three days, just really trying to get as much rest as, as possible. Um, and I, you know, besides my like mandated walks, uh, would, would try and, uh, you know, kind of work from the bed and in my, have my computer on top of me was kind of the easier way to do things. Um, you know, I think that there, everything that kind of came through was expected. So the, you know, I was told a lot about the shoulder pain, which was like a funny thing that I didn't expect. Um, and so I would alternate the heating pad between like the shoulder and my stomach. Um, or I would alternate with ice to just to kind of like change it up a little bit. Um, but I really think like knowledge was power for me. And so uh, based on kind of what I heard and what my experience was, I think my experience was actually better than, you know, even kind of the, some of the stories that I heard, which was helpful to me. Yeah, Gabrielle, I guess I should ask you then, was, was surgery kind of the start to finish from the pre-op experience, getting into the operating room, meeting your anesthesiologist, going under anesthesia, waking up, was that all kind of, did it, did that day for you ultimately turn out as you expected? Was there anything for either of you that happened on the day of surgery that you weren't expecting that, um, you know, that went really well or things that you're like, wait a second, I, I wasn't anticipating that. So honestly, I didn't know what to expect because I really didn't know anyone that ever had endometriosis. Um, most people around me didn't know what it was or never heard of it. Um, so I never knew anyone that had had the surgery. Um, so I didn't know what to expect. I guess my biggest fear was that I was going to wake up and have the colostomy bag, which my one, um, uh, my one provider, like, um, kind of made me nervous about. So I guess that was my fear, like waking up and what, what I was going to find. But, um, you know, initially I was taken pre-op and, you know, asked my medical history and then the IV and then, um, you know, walked into the, the operating room and it was cold. Like I vividly remember that. Um, but I just remember everyone being so nice and like supportive. And I remember like before I even knew it, I was out, like we were talking and I don't remember what I was talking about. Um, but all of a sudden I was asleep and I I've had a couple surgeries prior unrelated to endometriosis. So I knew what that part was about, but then, um, I woke up and like I said, I was in a bit of pain, um, but the nurse, you know, quickly took care of that. She was amazing post-op. Everyone was from start to finish. Um, and I knew that I knew that I would be in pain. I knew that, you know, this was kind of like the beginning, like of my journey. Um, but nothing was unexpected. I guess I should say that I didn't know what to expect, but nothing was unexpected. Um, you know, like, uh, Nadia had mentioned the shoulder pain I was prepared for. Um, uh, what else, you know, I had some incisional pain, but nothing, nothing major. Um, the hardest thing was not being able to sleep on my stomach or on my side. Um, but I knew that that was going to happen. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I was adequately educated and prepared for everything that happened. Nothing was a shock. Good. I'm glad to hear that. For the viewers who are wondering about the shoulder pain, um, the shoulder pain generally comes from the insufflation gas. Um, so that is one of the, I guess, side effects, for lack of a better term, that we expect, but um, it usually dissipates. I mean, both of you can speak to that after a couple of days. Um, and if it continues further than that, um, we tell patients to reach out, but usually that's kind of an annoying thing that happens. Um, but we, we kind of anticipate that. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this at the beginning, um, of our webinar, but the viewers are able to send in questions. I'm not sure if anything came through, um, during the webinar. 
Um, but Kiara said that she would let me know if she saw anything come through. So um, I guess the last question that I have for you both um, is what your greatest takeaways were from this experience. Um, and you know what recommendations or what insight you both have for patients who might be newly navigating this. I know that um, <clears throat> navigating the healthcare system as is, is extremely daunting and can be very challenging, um, especially for people that are younger who uh, by nature of not living as long, um, probably have a less experience with, with uh, healthcare and, and kind of figuring out where to go, who to go to, what the next steps are, you know, when you get back results, what do you do with them? So um, I guess it's kind of a, a double a double question, you know, what, what your takeaway was from the experience and any sort of recommendation or insight uh, for those who might be in the same position as you were a year, several years ago. I guess I would say um, be persistent and kind of take the reins of your care. You know, it kind of seems care and we follow the doctors or healthcare providers say, but if something doesn't feel right, you know, don't, don't ignore that. And, you know, give yourself grace, you know, like when you get the results, you know, don't, don't wish you did it sooner. Just be happy that you sought, you know, care um, when you did. Cause I think that's what I was feeling afterward. I was kind of like, oh, I wish I did this a year ago, you know, but you never know. to what you know like if I didn't try the bird like to surgery done something um so I guess my number one takeaway would would be be persistent you know if something doesn't feel right it, it may not be right it may not be normal um I think mine is in a similar vein you know kind of like trust yourself and um you know I think you, like she said, be persistent um, and also, you know, advocate for yourself too. If something just doesn't feel right, or if you, you know, I think having being told that there was like no way this was endometriosis by so many people and then, you know, uh, kind of keep persisting because I just felt like something wasn't right. Um, and so I think advocating for yourself, it definitely can be frustrating. And I, I don't think it's, it's an easy process and, you know, can definitely take a toll on you. But, um, you know, I think that, it, it's important to, to kind of make sure that you're, you're getting the care that you definitely deserve. Um, and, you know, I think the second part is like, take your diagnosis with, you know, um, whatever time you need to process it too. Obviously there are options out there, but um, any sort of diagnosis, you know, knowing that there is no cure is also something that's difficult to process. So I think taking whatever time and however it makes the most sense for you to kind of figure that out for yourself is helpful. Um, whether that's through friends and family, whether that's like by yourself, whether that's through finding people that, you know, have a similar experience or um, something of that vein. Uh, I think giving yourself, like Gabriella said, well, just giving yourself the grace to kind of figure that out for yourself. Yeah, I, I love both of that. I think it's, you know, the, the advocacy starts with you and, and finding the right people who align align with that. Um, so anyway, I am so appreciative to you both. You've both been amazing. And I really think that there's a lot to be taken from this webinar. Um, and unless either of you have anything else to add, I think we can wrap up for the rest of the night. Kiara, can I just check with you that we didn't get any extra questions? No, you didn't. You guys did great. Okay, great. And I think that about sums it up. Yeah.